Ray Castillo, thank you very much indeed for coming back onto Evolution Soup all the way from California. You are an anthropology major and guest relations associate at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum in Los Angeles. You were one of the very first guests on this channel talking about your internship at the museum as well as your passion for paleontology. So uh, how are you doing, Ray? It's uh, It's been a while. It has been. and. You know, thanks for having me back on. It's such a pleasure, and it has been a while. Uh, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of change since then, but today it's a beautiful California day, and I'm thankful to be here talking with you. Well, when we did that first interview, the pandemic hadn't hit yet. A heck of a lot of things have changed since then. You were, of course, working in the La Brea Tar Pits Museum, helping to educate the public, and now the museum is sadly closed, like so many others, but you found that it was an opportunity for you to pause and uh, reevaluate, isn't that right? Yes, yeah. So when the museums closed uh, because of the pandemic, at first it was a brief moment of what to do, um, and uh, it was a lot of waiting to see what updates might have came. But as time went on and we realized that this was something serious and that we might not get back to work uh, soon, I started seeing that. Uh, there was a pattern going on with not only myself, but everybody who was being seriously affected by the pandemic. And it was these questions that we had to ask ourselves is now we're at home. Now we're spending large amounts of time alone. And the questions arise, are we happy with ourselves? Are we happy with what we've made of ourselves? And are we happy with what we're doing with ourselves? And it was through this and all the time that's happened since the museum has closed that I have chosen to better myself by learning as much as I can about my field and learning as much as I can about myself and trying things that will make me happy as long as it keeps other people safe, of course. We still hope the museums open up soon, but I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to do things and to see things in the time that it's been closed that I can look back and say, you know, it, it was a, it was a le learning experience. I think you said you were uh, reading up on prehistoric mammals, synapses, and that kind of thing. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, since the museum's closed, um, I've not only been reading a ton about uh, the mammals that currently live in our world today, but also all the extinct mammals uh, from the ending of the dinosaurs to the beginning of uh, hominids rising. And, you know, it's an incredible journey to learn, but again, with all the free time and with all the opportunity to learn, I've also taken steps into learning about um, prehistoric animals like dinosaurs and like synapsids and, um, you know, even early fish and insects. So, I mean, it's a crazy world that um, used to exist here in ours that I don't think gets a lot of focus on. And, you know, people always focus on dinosaurs, but there's a whole world that was before and after that I think really needs the spotlight. Well, it's been a year since our last interview and a lot of interesting discoveries have been made in the world of science. So uh, what are some of the more intriguing ones that caught your eye last year? Well, one of the most intriguing things that I came across in 2020 is that anthropologists have kind of started deviating into a new subfield of anthropology, which they're calling primate archaeology and what primate archaeology's uh, objective is is to try and see how far our closest relatives like chimpanzees gorillas uh, or even monkeys like geladas or macaques or capuchins uh, have been in their own kind of stone age and some of these behaviors are quite phenomenal i mean uh, the first documented japanese macaque fishing is from 1979 on koshima island and what we've seen is that these Japanese macaques are able to fish so well and utilize these stone tools to crack open shellfish that they've mm. actually started destabilizing their populations. And the current theory goes that if the Japanese macaques continue to use the stone tools to crack open these shellfish in such frequency that they might eventually lose the ability to use stone tools as they're eating up all the shellfish. Another one that I thought was incredible probably my favorite one out of the group was in ethiopia where geladas which are a type of baboon 
have been seen to have a relationship with Ethiopian wolves, uh, which mm -hmm. kind of mimics early domestication of dogs that humans did uh, roughly 25, 30,000 years ago. And the way we see this, is that the wolves don't directly live with the geladas. They come and they take advantage of the geladas saying, hey, you know, come here, eat these rodents for free. And in defense, we get um, protection from other predators because we got all these wolves around. Mm. And it creates a buddy type system, which we have seen uh, in early humans and in early dogs um, during the Pleistocene. Uh, along with that, we have seen that the geladas and the wolves uh, have a weird relationship where the wolves are actually um, acting different to the geladas. Instead of their normal aggressive behavior and sounds, they approach the geladas with more of a relaxed, calm, slow movements, showing that the wolves and geladas obviously know each other that way to assume, hey, if you get aggressive with me, we'll get aggressive back. But they don't. They are both calm and relaxed around each other uh, in this relationship, this friendship, as you will. Along with that, um, there was the incredible dire wolf discovery made earlier this year, uh, seeing that the dire wolves are not directly related to wolves, but instead a much older lineage of dogs, of bone-crushing dogs. I think the term that they're calling them now is um, Anon Sion, Anon Dyrus, I believe. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was an incredible discovery. And I've gotten to uh, work with dire wolves in the past. Uh, while I was in the fossil lab for the tar pits, I uh, was able to clean tar off of them and work with a bunch of their cast replicas. And, I mean, at the time, I assumed they were, do they were dogs, they were wolves. I mean, you work with them every day, and then these minute differences, these very specific um, evidences in the bones that completely change the way we think of everything. And I think it's beautiful that even hundreds of years after the dire wolf has been discovered, we are still changing up the way we think about uh, mammals and the way we think about paleontology as a whole. You know, I was very pleased to be able to uh, interview Angela Perry, of course, worked on that, on that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I thought that was, was, that paper was released as well. And, you know, it's an amazing thing that uh, someone like that has been able to dedicate such a large time looking at so many different specimens over so much different time. It shows that the passion for paleontology and the love for the specifics and things that people might not be interested in is still very much there. And when the discoveries are made, it just goes to show that the field of paleontology is always growing and it's always evolving, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah, and it's not just we've discovered something new. It's like, oh, we thought this, and actually we were wrong, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. which is the good thing about science, isn't it? Yes, it's the it's an amazing thing because um, though we have a pretty good idea of a lot of things, a lot of things are still very much theories. Well, you've been doing a lot of traveling and found yourself in quite a few sites of scientific interest lately. So can uh, can you tell us about those? Yeah, so, I mean, again, with the pandemic happening and the museums closing, unfortunately, it's been a time where everything is closed, where there really isn't a chance for people to go out and socialize or to uh, have fun. But uh, in that, I've had the opportunity to travel in small groups or alone to these beautiful fossil sites. Uh, some of them include Shark Tooth Hill in Bakersfield, along with Bluff Cove, California on the coast, um, where they're both Miocene deposits. And in the case of Bluff Cove, you can find fragments of whale, you can find fragments of uh, camelids, you find all types of uh, Miocene fossils there. And at Shark Tooth Hill, you find a lot of shark teeth, a lot of shells and uh, fish fossils. And th these are soft sediments that you don't really have to dig too deep for. As a matter of fact, I remember the Museum of Buena Vista was offering a pretty good amount of money for people who found uh, Aladestinus fossils, which are a type of sea lion. But I've also gone to places like Rainbow Basin and Owl Canyon, other Miocene deposits, uh, where Gomphothere footprints uh, were very prevalent. And Gomphotheres being these um, elephant-like oh, right. relatives, yeah. yeah. And, and for anyone who doesn't know, the Miocene is about 5 to 25 million years ago, something like yes. that? Yeah, and the kind of fossils that you find at Rainbow Basin and Owl Canyon are bear dogs, gomphotheres, camels, 
uh, early cats, and the gonfa deer footprints were very prevalent. They're, they're, they're probably the most common thing that I saw there uh, in these giant stone slabs with just these perfectly preserved uh, footprints in them. But uh, I've also gone out of the state to places like uh, Utah and Colorado for Dinosaur National Monument and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, uh, along with Texas and New Mexico with Aztec Cave and Crystal de Rey Mountains, which um, Aztec Cave is a Cretaceous and Pleistocene uh, site. So you find a lot of dinosaur there such as Acrocanthosaurus, uh, you find a lot of Clovis points in Aztec Cave uh, in El Paso, Texas. Um, and at Cristo de Rey, which is in New Mexico, it's a Cretaceous site. So you find a lot of dinosaur footprints and a lot of um, shells and fish and teeth and scrap bones. As a matter of fact, we had found a bone there that we haven't been able to identify but it really isn't that big it's uh, fragmentary at best it, we believe it to be a piece of leg wow and of course uh, the good thing about this sort of uh, outing is is that you're in the wide open spaces and you're you couldn't be more socially distanced could you yeah yeah um we were so uh out in the dist uh, for crystal de Rey specifically in new mexico i was out there completely alone and isolated and i was so isolated that the only attention that i got or from border patrol agents and they came up to me and they're like oh like you're suspicious like you're the only person out here for miles and miles and miles and I said yeah I'm a college student and the museum here in New Mexico gave me a permit to come out here and just look around and I showed them my permits and they left me alone and then they came back with another one and I asked them I was like do you know where I can find dinosaur footprints and that um, Border Patrol agent was nice enough to actually give me a ride across the desert. It's to because you said dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, right. I, said, I said dinosaur, and they're like, oh, we know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that's cool. Okay, fine. Everything's cool now. And uh, didn't you also write, come across uh, evidence of prehistoric whales, did you say? Yes. So uh, at Bluff Cove, California, some of the rocks that you find actually have either the imprint of the fossil or the fossil itself of um, prehistoric whales. And these are mysticetes, so baleen whales. So you'll find a lot of their um, cranial uh, remains and a lot of their um, like lower jaw, the, yeah, the lower jaw that holds the baleen. Uh, on top of that, you find a lot of... Um, Camelid remains, which I was never lucky enough to find any, um, but also supposedly, I again, I haven't seen this, but people that I've worked with at that site, they've said that they also find a lot of cattle, like cow and bison, um, but I, again, I've only found uh, fish and whale at that site, and these are big rocks that are heavy as heck that have these fossils in them. Oh, these would be around 25 to 30 million years old. Wow. Ray, you're now an anthropology major. I know your passion is paleontology. So how did you find yourself studying anthropology? Well, with anthropology, I learned that it is an umbrella field for everything that I am interested in. And of course, I, I am interested in paleontology. I love paleontology. But with anthropology, it's allowed me to not only get a broader sense of who we are as a species, but where we come from and why we are the way we are. Because there are things like social anthropology, which kind of go on to explain all the social norms that we have today, like birthdays and gifts. But there's also cultural anthropology, which looks back at the origins of our arts, our fashion, our, um, our expressionism. But when it comes to the paleontology aspect, there are paleoanthropology. And I love paleoanthropology because it lets me and the people that study the field like me to see what prehistoric humans were like, what our fossils can tell us about the world we live in, the animals that we lived with, the tools that we use, and the art that we produced. Uh, and then you go into fields like archaeology, which show us beautiful remnants of the past, uh, like buildings and artifacts and weapons and clothing. And you know, anthropology as a whole has been an, is, is an amazing field uh, that encapsulates everything that I thought I could be interested in. And this includes linguistics, biology, zoology, as there's fields like anthrozoology, which aim to study the relationship between animals and humans. 
as for studying online, it has been a bit of a challenge as uh, I'm used to the traditional classroom setting where you are front and center and present and interacting. And with online uh, transition, I really felt a step back because as I started, at least in the early days of the pandemic, I started seeing that the online learning was quite easy. And when it came to things like Anthropology 101 and 102, I really felt like I had already known everything there was to know about that before we were learning about it in class. Some of our assignments included um, writing about specific prehistoric apes and then drawing a picture of them, but I had already done that for dozens and dozens of prehistoric apes long before it was asked of me. So (laughs) so it was like, okay, well, I already know the information being told to me here. So it's kind of like... a refreshed course but with the current um track that the online learning is going it's 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 good it's encouraging people to kind of take on their own field and if you take it seriously the way i take anthropology um the classes are only there to kind of hammer in the information that you need whereas now you have all this space and time to apply that and to hone in on your senses for that field yeah, and thankfully we have things like Zoom and, and StreamYard for this kind of work, and it's it's made things a heck of a lot easier, hasn't it? Yes, exactly. Because I mean, it could have been it could have been worse. I mean, if the technologies like Zoom and StreamYard weren't around, we would have had, you know, typing chat rooms. We would have had phone communication lines and group calls. I, I think it just would have been overall uh, much more. Skype. Does that still exist? <laughs> Skype. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it does, but uh, I mean, with the current. Uh, streaming services that we have yeah. I don't think it's very uh, useful so what we have over there is a gorgosaurus a member of the tyrannosaur family well you started a new YouTube channel Anthropos Logica From the looks of things, the aim of this channel is to introduce audiences to some of the lesser known and weirder dinosaur species that have been discovered. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, the YouTube channel was something that I had been planning for a long time. It's just I really needed um, the right format before I was able to release anything. And it was actually another YouTuber called Northo2 which uh, kind of got me off my butt and told me, hey, you know, you should upload. Even if it's not very good, you should upload. And the goals and objective that I have for this YouTube channel is to present paleontology in a fun way, similar to uh, Nigel Marvin uh, did with Chased by Dinosaurs, where um, I'll be able to kind of make light of uh dinosaurs and mammals but at the same time still revert back to giving an actual lesson on the animal or dinosaur that we're talking about that episode and for the first episode we did gorgosaurus which i chose gorgosaurus because he's not as well known as tyrannosaurus rex or other types of tyrannosaurs and that really is the objective for the show to kind of give the spotlight to animals that aren't really well known in the general populace uh and the next episode as a matter of fact we're i'm still trying to debate whether it's going to be about the creatures of the labrea tar pits or if we're going to be talking about extinct um carnivores that came after the dinosaurs things like um terror birds and you know Mm -hmm. giant snakes the megalodon um the giant komodo dragon um Varanus Priscus, Megalania. So, I mean, we, I certainly have a lot of topics to cover, and the fact that I have gotten help uh, with visual effects, with computer generated images and green screens, uh, we're able to do a lot more now with that. And with the coming videos, I really would like to just hammer in the fact that this is all fun, but learn a thing or two while you're here. So we might see you riding on the back of a megalodon at some point in the future, and then. Hey, let's, who knows? We could it's definitely idea. do that. It's a really good idea. Right. It's certainly been great catching up with you. You always have such great stories to tell, and your love of science is definitely infectious. But before we sign off, what words of encouragement could you give to any young people who might be watching this right now and who are who really want to get into paleontology, uh, anthropology, or the sciences in general? but are feeling a bit discouraged by the 
restrictions of the pandemic? Now, this is a good question because the question is, what do I do or how can I do it? And the answer is quite simple. It's much simpler than uh, a lot of us might imagine. Uh, of course, museums are unfortunately closed in a lot of places. But the good thing is that because of the technologies that we have at our disposal, many, many museums have their collections online, which you can see and study for yourself. Or they have virtual tours of their museum online as well, such as the Museum of Utah. Um, but if I had any advice to the young ones who wish to pursue paleontology even amongst the pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis is simply read. Uh, read as much as you can on whatever subject that interests you the most. Uh, one thing that I love about books is that it presents arguments and points of view that aren't exactly forced down your throat. The good thing about reading two different books on the same subject is that you get two different perspectives and two opinions on the same subject, and thus you can formulate your own opinion and thoughts on it. And I think that's one of the best ways of learning. Another good thing to do is, of course, with social distancing, uh, if you can, travel to certain locations or localities that are significant in the world of paleontology. As I mentioned, uh, some sites here in California uh, I'm sure that most states have some kind of historical or archaeological or paleontological um, sites around. Uh, some of these can be things like national parks. Others can be actual paleontological dig sites. And sometimes it could be right, ne right down the street or the local beach or the local park. I will leave links to your social media and your YouTube channel in the description below and all that's left to say is thank you once again ray for coming back onto evolution soup i really appreciate it and i hope that all of you watching have enjoyed uh the conversation between me and mark here and uh i hope that everybody tunes into the youtube channel to see a bunch of dinosaurs chase me around <laughs>